Here's one of those moments where what we said in the past might have been wrong. Check this out. CBD, especially full spectrum based CBD products, might actually be a good pre-workout. Studies are showing that people who take CBD and then work out report that they enjoy the workout more. And this has a lot of value. <laughs> oh, is it, they report they enjoy the workout That's right, more. dude. There's a study. <laughs> yeah. I have a saying I that I say, you know, what, you know what makes weed so awesome? <laughs> no, it it's makes, not weed. It's it makes CBD. everything else awesome, more <laughs> awesome. <It's> a, <laughs> no, even it's, your, it's, work, your workouts are it's better. It's an actual study. It's more fun. It, it says, like a, listen, the, stu- the title of the study is Effects of Cannabidiol. Remember, Cannabidiol- hey, Brought to you by Granddaddy Purple. No, dude. <laughs> who, who funded the study? Okay, let's, let's, we got to correct this. <laughs> CBD is non-psychoactive, so it's not like weed. You're not going to get high or whatever. But <laughs> yeah. in other words, you take it and you don't get all like you smoke the joint and it's legal, right? Hemp CBD. Yes, yes, yes. It's totally legal. We work with a company called Ned. Right. You could buy this in all 50 states. Right, right. Full spectrum. Hemp Sorry, I know I'm messing your commercial up. No Keep problem. Going. So here's what it says, the study. Effects of cannabidiol on exercise physiology and bioenergetics. It's a randomized control pilot trial. And what they found is it increased uh, ratings of pleasure, which then increased uh, performance. So it alters some key physiological and psychological responses to aerobic exercise without impairing performance. Now, why is this valuable? Well, I mean, if you can enjoy the workout more and create better associations with exercise, you're probably more likely to do it. Do and you, so this may have some value for so, people who just hate so working So we're correcting out. ourselves? Yes, because we always, remember when CBD got all big and yeah. everybody's like, take it as a pre-workout, like you're stupid. Well, I mean, we, I guess when we were speculating about it, I was like, it might be great in a setting where I'm doing like mobility or something. A little or more aerobic. Pair, a parasympathetic, but yeah, aerobic for sure. Like that was like one of those things. So, okay, there was a study that actually came out a long time ago, uh, or at least it's it's been a while, four or five years, where they talked about uh, even weed, THC. Yeah, yeah. And actually, the the pros of that for like uh, ultra marathon runners yes. and things like that. So yes. we, I already knew that that for that, I'm not a fan of it for weight training. Although, yeah, just CBD may not be bad. Now, here's why I think. Here's why none of us are fans of something like that for weight training. It's it's. I think it has more to do with the fact that we love the feeling. Yeah, of I like ramping anyway. up too. I just like the feel. I don't need to take anything to make me enjoy it. I already love. I it. I do but- hate cardio though. Mm. Right. So that may be where it's valuable. Maybe we use uh, Ned and then we go running or something like that. Maybe yeah. we'll start to enjoy it. I have to take a lot of Ned to make that happen. I, mean, I mean, do you think that's the Don't main that the main mechanism that totally. makes people feel? It's just that it, it's a, it's an overall mood improving compound. Uh, 100%. Therefore, it just improves. One of the number one reasons why somebody will fatigue or stop, it has more to do or has some to do, I should say, with their subjective feeling of pain Mm. and tolerance. People think that their bodies give out because their bodies give out. The truth is most people don't know how to push themselves to that point because they just can't tolerate the pain. They can't tolerate the challenge. So if you can create subjective or enhance, I should say, subjective feelings of enjoyment and pleasure, people are going to work out harder. Yeah, or the work overall out more often. experience is yeah. going to be Now, the truth enjoyable. is, anecdotally, we've been working with Ned now. How long have you been with Ned, Adam? Uh, five years. Five years, yeah. okay. I've gotten... I mean, I mean, countless messages from people who are like, hey, I know you guys recommend this for inflammation, stress. I love taking it before I work out. Feels great. We've never promoted it as a pre-workout just because it's like whatever. We don't like to necessarily promote things that way. Um, but it's, I mean, this is a study that shows that people who took it enjoyed the workouts more. And I can see value in that. You know, for the average person, when I'm trying to get them to enjoy exercise and all they feel is pain and struggle and it sucks uh-huh. and it's hard and it takes a while to learn how to, develop a different relationship with that pain, this may help. Yeah, that's interesting. I know I, I've definitely taken it with caffeine or like before um, to to make sure I don't get too jittery and high with, yeah. with my caffeine to kind of ride out that energy a bit more. But I've never taken it exclusively, you know, before working out. I always thought like I might be a little too, uh, too chill. Yeah. Yeah, I like – so – and you actually introduced me that way of using it. It, it gave me a very um, – almost like theanine does with caffeine. It's a euphoric. Uh, yeah, a euphoric you do focus. feel good. Yeah. yeah, I mean, is and that is that fair to ex- yeah. like explain it Stimulated. that way? It kind of it felt like that when you when you got me using theanine with my caffeine. Uh, I really like that combination. Similarly, I like the CBD with the caffeine like that. It kind of mitigates the jittery kind of. It makes and for me, it enhances the feeling. I, I mean, um, full disclosure, I use it. I don't use uh, hemp oil as a pre workout, but I do often use it as a pre like work. 
like pre create, write, come up with ideas for the podcast yeah. or the show. Um, or if I'm reading or researching, um, and I want to have uh, more insight, um, then sometimes I'll use it. So that's what it does for me. But I have such a good relationship with strength training because you're right with cardio, that might be a good idea. But with strength training, I have such a good relationship with it that, you know, I like the way I feel when I have some caffeine and go lift. I don't need necessarily to do anything else. Well, I still stand by our original statement because all the rest of the products out there are garbage. That's true. Let's be honest. That is true. I don't know how many, I mean, you, they're most just people, selling you like the CBDs in the title of the pre-workout just to kind of nobody pitch checks. it to you. Yeah. Nobody checks what's it's in not there. full spectrum. No, in fact, at the gas station, I was at the gas station yesterday. Yeah. At the gas station, at the at the counter, CBD products. I'm like, get out of here. These are not. I guarantee none of these have actual CBD yeah. in them. I mean, has I the market dipped a bit? Because I, I know it was like crazy there for a while. Like the whole boom. That's of CBD. a good question. Yeah. We should see what the CBD market looks like. Oh, now. I would think overall like it's filtered grown, out, it's continued to grow, but it's oversaturated now. I mean, yeah. there's now they started putting it in everything. Yeah, I mean, Shampoo, we called that though. We knew that skincare product. I mean, yeah, we, we knew we knew it'd be it be in everything like that. It's one of those. It's because you can attach it to benefits to everything. Yeah. You know, so because you can say it's better for everything, it's just like, oh, you know what the problem with hair, that is? skin, mood, sleep, I've seen energy. This, <laughs> so <laughs> I've, I've seen this happen with supplements too, where there's an efficacious dosage and product that actually has some benefit, but because the market's not regulated and you could, I could literally create a supplement right now and put on it. This contains CBD, creatine, vitamin C, magnesium, whatever. Nobody's going to check. Right. Nobody will ever check. all of it. So the problem that happens whenever something gets super popular is a lot of crap floods the market. Everybody tries it because the vast majority of products don't have what they say they have in it. Everybody then decides it doesn't work, right? So it's like, they, oh, I've tried CBD. I didn't notice anything from it. Well, oh, wow. Interesting. CBD. The market is dramatically slowing. Yeah. Talking about cutting. Okay, so it says, huh. CBD pioneer Charlotte's Web said in November, earnings call that stores were cutting back on shelf space, leading total cannabidiol distri distribution points to decline about 20% from the previous year. That's it a felt big... like that, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, that was the wow. trend. Now, on the, flip I side, was wrong. on the flip side, Ned, when we started with them versus now, oh, they yeah. are oh, way, way, way bigger. Well, I mean, here's so a thing. They that's keep what innovating it, with new products, I, though, too. I think that's what it is, though. I think it's that you had a lot of crap. Yeah, the cream is going to rise to the top. Yep. And you know what? Probably since, I mean, we can continue to speculate. I don't know for sure, but- Probably what has a lot to do with that is if you have a market that exploded that fast and more than 50% of them are charlatans and pixie dust and garbage, yep. that you're going to turn off a lot of first-time users thinking like, this is shit, mm -hmm. and then not going away. So everybody races in because they hear and read all the articles. Half of the people that are getting good stuff maybe continue using the other half that get bullshit and get sold trash, go like, oh, this is this is not worth well, it. Well, that article right there, Doug, you just you were just on one. It said the CBD market was uh, projected to be, by 2028, $47 billion. <laughs> so that's big. Wow. Yeah, that that's big time. Big and I think market. that's worldwide. I don't know, Doug. You, you, you don't want to disconnect wanna, it from the TV. You don't want to, because I actually have, I've talked about, uh, since we've worked with, the evolution working with Ned, uh, as far as, the, my, I've, I've, I love all their products and and I have nothing negative to say about any of them. I've actually enjoyed all of them. But uh, the Mellow is what has become my staple. Incidentally, the one without CBD. That's the one, a magnesium product. Right. So that that has been amazing. But I, recently I've been using edibles. I normally smoke. You guys know that's how I normally consume cannabis, but I've been trying to limit that. And I, I came off a while ago. And then when I started back up again, I said, instead of smoking, I'm going to try edibles, even though I'm never yeah. a huge. And what I don't like about edibles, again, it's just, it's harder for me to gauge, and then I sometimes I get really higher than I want to be from them. And what I noticed was what I started doing, and it made a difference. I just this is like the last week, so I had no and I had no idea we we're going to go here or nothing. Uh, I st I have also like very high CBD, and I remember you always telling me like I should keep a one to one ratio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if I get if I have t uh, an edible, and this these are edible, these are normal. It's not netted. This is normal like you know cannabis club uh, dispensary type edibles that have THC and CBD. You know, we're talking about like 10, you know, five, 10 milligram doses or like that. Sometimes when I get different edibles, when I hit 10 milligrams, sometimes 10 feels like 20 to me. And sometimes 10 feels like five. And when they feel like too much, I feel really high and it disrupts my sleep. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. But what I noticed was when that feeling comes on, I've trained myself. I have, I have pure CBD with the, with yeah. the Ned stuff. So I go get or the full spectrum, you know, yeah. uh, which has got no THC. I take that. Balances it. And I, then I can sleep. 
Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't know how to explain what's happening there. It but does have a balancing effect. It also reduces, so this is for THC users, uh, CBD with THC reduces the short-term memory loss effects that THC definitely creates. So using THC regularly, you'll get short-term memory loss. Using it with CBD, CBD mitigates it. Okay, so here's a secret. This is a fact. If you use THC, now that we're on that topic, and you get too much THC, you want to know what you could take that'll like take it way down? Mm. Ibuprofen. Oh, really? Because of inflammation? It, it, look it up, Doug. Look up ibuprofen and uh, THC or ibuprofen and, and cannabis. So I'm going to do that. I'm so gonna if you're like, if like, oh my God, I'm paranoid too much, yeah. drop like five, you know, 600 milligrams of, of ibuprofen. So I'm going to do that paired with the, the full spectrum and see what happens because mm -hmm. I've already teased in and out the full spectrum and I notice a dramatic difference. Because again, I've been doing these edible things and it's hit and miss. Also, if I'm on an empty stomach or not, like of all course. that stuff makes a difference. Yeah. What type, what brand of edible? And it's they're, they're they're close when they say five or ten milligrams, but they're not all precise. And it does matter what's going on in my digestive system and stuff like yeah. that. So, and I've teased this out enough times now where I go over and I use the full spectrum with the when I get too high and it it balances me out. And then I and then I'm like, oh, maybe it was just maybe I just. And, uh, did, and did you know you can also increase the strength of THC by, I believe, eating papaya enzyme with it. It in increases the amount of THC that'll get circulating in your system. <laughs> you want to increase it more? Well, you guys know me. I get dorky. I mean, if day. you really want to increase it, you don't eat. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. You don't, if you don't, uh, to me, that's one of the most dramatic differences mm. on the strength of feeling THC is empty stomach versus fed. Now, you know that- You the, eat and you, it, it, you know it the, cuts the it in half. The THC converts to, there's two different types of THC. When you eat it, it converts to something different versus yeah, when you, you mean inhale it. You metabolize it, it. yeah. It turns that's, it a different That's why chemical. some people are like edible people and other people are that's me. smoke yeah. people. Yeah, smoke, if edible. I, yeah, I'll be more paranoid the other way. I weigh right yeah. smoke. I'm trying to be because I know that eating is much healthier for me yes. to do, go that way. So I'm trying to be more the edible guy. It's a different high. It lasts longer than I like sometimes. I get more anxiety it, from smoking. I think it's mainly because it's of so the funny. Coughing it's and the stuff. Like, yeah, because like then it I, it has this weird effect too, where like the anxiety will come up a little bit, and then it's like I pay too much attention to my breathing, mm. and then I'm like <laughs> sitting there just like <sighs> breathe. What a <sighs> terrible feeling! It's awful. It's yeah. got to be the word. I already found the study, Doug. If you couldn't uh, find I've, it, yeah, I found it. I just don't understand it. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> just to be honest here, uh, yeah, yeah but it shows that it reduces some of the effects. Um, so. Is that the ibuprofen that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. interesting. I didn't know. Yeah, that. I read that a long time ago. Kind of, you know, kind of interesting. All right. And by the way, I was just going to say, sure. uh, another another article or study says that CBD demand is actually going up. Uh, in 20, let's see, in 2021, it was $4.9 billion, anticipated by 2028 to be $47.2 billion. Oh. Ten, that's 10 times more. Okay. So, that so was more. that fake that, news? So well, it, you know what it was, Justin? It was reported from a single brand. Oh, Charlotte's that, Charlotte's Web is a is they a went down twenty percent. Yes, oh, okay. is a popular brand. I so see. that makes sense though, because back then when Charlotte's Web Charlotte's Web got famous because they were the one that um, Dravet I syndrome, I think it's called. It's this Charlotte's it, like, Web, Harlequin, and or were like the three dominant. Yes, but but Charlotte's Web got popular nationwide because there's a a type there's a form of epilepsy that is very hard to treat. It's terrible. It's a terrible, it's, I mean, mm. it breaks my heart when I when I think about it, but these children have like 50 to 100 seizures a day. There's no treatment. And this was all, by the way, this is the beauty. This is one of the beautiful things of the internet. At the time, there was no treatment. There were no drugs, nothing you could do. You'd basically watch your child deteriorate and eventually develop brain damage. Well, parents were on forums talking to each other, trying to figure out what the hell's going on. And some people were reporting, hey, CBD, really makes a difference with my seizures. Mm -hmm. So there was a, I think it's in Colorado, they were growing this, they grew this strain called Charlotte's Web. high CBD strain. And yeah. it attracted all these parents with these children. And this is, they started using it and they started finding that their kids stopped having seizures. This is what drove the research and this is what created the now medication yeah. for this type of, uh, of, of epilepsy. Well, you know, Courtney was a, a pediatric nurse and, you know, during that time where they were finding out all that information, like they actually had some of that strain locked up like in the hospital, really? but like wow. it wouldn't, it wasn't like promoted advertising anything, but like they would ask the parent if they were comfortable and sometimes, and this is whack when it was like a lot more taboo yeah. uh, because it smelled and everything too. And like it, the, the aroma was in, was in the, 
um, hospital and she would go like get it and give it to the parents and like, but they were like providing it because it was so effective. Yes. It was like amazing. It's called Dravet, Dravet syndrome or Dravet syndrome. That's yeah. what it is. So, yeah. So, but, um, it's, it's, it's crazy because the, there was no answer and these parents found out themselves through the internet working together. Yeah. And then what they did is they, the government <clears throat> fast tracked the development of a CBD, um, based, uh, medication, for this, this was the company. I can't remember. I invested in, in them and eventually made a great return on it because I was reading about this. But um, I mean, pretty wild. So you know, some good stories of the internet, along you know with all this shit that the internet creates. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Today's program giveaway is Maps Powerlift. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video. The first 24 hours that we drop it here on YouTube. Also subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. We are also running a workout program sale. We put together a brand new workout program bundle called the Time Crunch Bundle. This includes Maps 15 Minutes, Maps Anywhere, Maps Prime, and the ebook Eat for Performance. This would normally be priced at over $300, but right now you can get it all for $99.99. There's only three days left for this promotion. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. You know, speaking of articles, did you guys see that article that John Deloney shared on the Dave yes. Ramsey the, about the income, the medium income, or the income that would uh, like what's the max income where you'll have positive impacts on happiness? Like, 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 there's a limit, right? Once you make past oh, a certain right. amount, you don't get any more happy, right? So the old studies didn't so Arthur I, Brooks talk about this too? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I looked this up, Adam. I read the study. Okay. So the old studies that often get quoted is. $75,000. Now, this was done in 2010, by the way. So I'm sure based on that data, it's going to change a little bit because the cost of living and all that stuff. But yeah. what they found in 2010 was up to up to $75,000, the more you made, generally you'd be happier. Once you made $75,000 and once you made beyond that, there was no real significant impact on happiness. Once your like basic needs were completely met, yes. your your bills, like all those things. Yeah, if you're covered. not stressed about yeah. money, you have a house, you have bills, you can afford to pay, you, you know, you can pay your bills, you can pay for food, you're okay, then you don't really get happier making more money. That was the whole basis of that. Well, this latest study showed that um, it's more recent showed that it actually is up to $500,000. <laughs> That's a big difference. Wow. That's a huge yeah. Whoa, that difference. yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so now I, I looked at the study okay. and here's, here's what, I, here's, here's what I found. I love your guys' speculation on this. Okay. Here's what they found. You got to go deeper. Okay. There's a percentage of people that are considered, um, happy just generally, right? right. They just have this predisposition to be happy. Mm -hmm. And then there's this, these are the people that said, honey, if we live in our bridge together and we yeah. had just each other, yeah. we, you guys know oh, people like this, right? Yeah. They're, just, they're just happy. It's those happy people, people, they say right? that. Uh -huh. And then there's those people. Katrina says that shit to me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I say, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> like, I'm not going to be happy. That's yeah, so what I tell her. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I would not be living in a trailer. I would not yeah. be happy. You're going to rummage through trash and be as happy. As long as we had each other, we would be so happy. I've been thinking a lot about what you said. I bought a tent. We're going to live in a tent from now on. You know, close to the earth. <laughs> it's okay. romantic, right? And the then there's of it. and then yeah. there's a percentage of people that are just, you know, they're just miserable. And we know people like that too. Like no matter what, you're just unhappy. Yeah, there's yeah. definitely a lot of those. Yes. Yeah. So here's what they found. Within the study, the unhappiest 15% of people, so people who generally are just mm, not happy, they don't get any happier over a hundred thousand dollars. So up to a hundred grand, they get happier, happier. After a hundred grand, it doesn't change anything. Okay. Now here's where they got the number for the five hundred thousand dollars. The happy people, the happiest 30% of people. So these people are always happy, mm -hmm. okay? They got happier and happier and happier up to $500,000. And then they stopped getting happier. So what is your- yeah, what's what, what? Where are they getting that metric? Like what, what does that step look like? What do you mean? Um, so how they measure how it? they keep getting happier. Well, it's a survey. It's, all it's a survey. Yeah, yeah, it's a survey. So as they've increased, I mean, look at we could we could play this game with ourselves. All, everybody has been is made up to that. So, what do you guys recall at what point in your lives as you climb that financial ladder? Ever, ever say every hundred k, hundred k, two hundred k, three hundred k? Do you re, do you recall like what what point? that you you cross that threshold. Yeah, yeah, I do. For me, it was And so, like, by the way, this is how this study is conducted. You know, there's yeah. a thousand by, people that have made X amount of dollars. And by the way, these are general numbers because, I, I mean, it depends where you live. I'm of sure course. the number's way different. Of course. Yeah. Bay Area versus, you know. It still is, a, I still think totally. it's, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, thought discussion. You know what I'm saying? As far as like, 
the for, thing. Yeah, for me, it was when I stopped worrying about money your altogether. saturation point. Yeah, once I stopped worrying about money altogether, I know my kids will be taken care of. I know we're going to be fine. We don't have to worry about I don't even have to think about it. Beyond that, then it doesn't matter for me. My lifestyle won't change. So, I mean, I'm not going to give numbers, but th th there's a point that I reached where I was like, I don't have to worry about it anymore. So, and anything beyond that, it's not going to really change much for me. You know, for me, it was less about the dollar amount I was making every year. It was actually more about how I had set up like financial security for myself as mm. far as mm -hmm. passive income, yes, retirement, yeah. yes. and my fa if I were to die, yeah, same thing, that exactly. made a bigger impact than the actual dollar amount yeah. that I was making. Because I, so, I mean, it's been well over 10 hmm. years where I crossed over that threshold. And when I crossed over that threshold, I'd say I was happy, but I still was... I still wasn't content. I still wanted more, but why I wanted more. You weren't feeling secure. I wasn't feeling secure. Yeah. Once I felt secure that if I left, if I, for something tragic happened to me, that my family would be okay. Or if something tragic happened and I lost the current job that was making that income, would I feel still okay? Like no urgency. Oh my God, I got to get a job tomorrow yeah, yeah. because I have all these crazy bills. Yeah. Once that feeling had went away, it actually didn't matter if it was 250, 500. It didn't exactly. matter. That was actually yeah. the main thing was, can I build up enough passive income and a safety net and retirement, all that stuff. By the way, that's an equation with two sides, earnings okay. and spending. Yes. Mm -hmm. People think it's just earnings. No, okay. spending is very important too. You can increase your earnings, spending but you can also bring down your spending. Spending is not just very important. It is everything. Yeah. It is 95% of the equation yeah. is the ability to delay gratification yeah. and to live significantly below your means. And be happy with what you Which is that, that, that last study I brought up, which well, was- that, was from Ramsey's group. Large. That was a large. By the way, that was the largest study ever done on millionaires. Yeah. That last mm -hmm. one I brought up. Oh yeah. Where the teachers were number three, mm -hmm. and it just highlights that. Yeah, they don't make a lot mm -hmm. of money, but they spend it well. You know what they they went into detail about that, and you know what they talked about those five professions. So you remember what they were, Doug? By the chance they were engineer, CEO, accountant, uh, accountant uh, CPA, 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 right? And then the teacher. So these are all uh, um, people that have jobs where there's very there's structure and systems and things they follow. Mm -hmm. Like you, you do this, you follow this, you get so this out. they apply outcome. it to their that's right. spending. That was actually the common theme when you, when you, cause you look at those five professions, it's like, that's weird. There's not a doctor in there. There's not this in there. Like day traders you would think in there. Yeah. It's like these people have these very structured type of careers that you do X, Y, and Z, and this is the outcome. You follow these, these things. Right. That makes sense. And so they've applied that same philosophy into saving money. All right, so let's go back to the study, right? Happiest 30% of people get happier and happier up to $500,000 a year. My theory is that if you're a happy person, generally speaking, you know where to spend the money to bring value for yourself. If you're that kind of person and you give that kind of person more money, they know what brings them joy. They know what brings them happiness. And so they're like, oh, $100,000? Oh, $200,000? Oh, oh, I don't. You I know created what you do with the that. formula and the discipline. I don't agree with that. That's what I think. I don't agree with that. What do you and think the reason why I don't agree with that is because I think they're, they are totally separate. Not that that can't be true. So I don't disagree that it, that can't be true, what you're saying. It's that the, there's those are two different disciplines. Well, or what's different, the relationship? Like there's, okay, there's, there's people who, like, uh, I mean, I, I would think this. I'm, I'm a person who... Uh, I shoveling shit. I was happy. I loved my job. Yeah. I loved every job I ever did. You know how shitty it was or what time I had to get up or how hard it was or how little I made. I've loved everything that I did. So I would, I would think I'm in that category, but it wasn't until my late twenties, early thirties, did I get good discipline around money? So, you know, I, I would be far more wealthy than I am today. Had I had those disciplines already in place you know, 10, so are you, 15 so years ago. Do you think or, then the correlation is that the 30% of happiest people also simultaneously have, because the correlation is happiest people get more happiness up to $500,000. So are you saying that's because they have better spending habits? I mean, I think that that's part of the process, right? So as you make more money, I think in turn, you have to build better habits. So I'll get, look, here's why I mean- I don't, I don't think they're, I, I, they're trying to make a correlation between them. I don't think there is. That's the, that's the correlation they found. Right. So that, I mean, that's what, yeah, but it's not causation, right? So I don't, I don't think that that is, it's directly connected. Well, like here's that. what I think. I, I, if I can think right now to people I know in my life that are just the miserable people, and if I think about the people that I know in my life, they're just the happy people. And if I gave them both $100,000, I know for a fact, the happy people that I know would really enjoy that $100,000. And I know the really shitty, miserable people I'd give a hundred grand to, it wouldn't do, it wouldn't do anything for them. Yeah. The way they would spend it and use it, they just, it wouldn't give them any value. 
that's why I think the, the way I well, think. I think that's where the uh, that saying like "more money, more problems." Like, it, I've, it, I just think that if you don't build that discipline and you understand like how to grow the money or how how to like put yourself in a, in, in a position where you could step away and you're you're going to be fine, be taken to care, you know. Uh, you're going to be taken care of and like have that investment, like kind of waiting f- there for you. I think that's really where like the happiness starts to come that, in. That's I, why I don't think there's much of a correlation I, there because but, I, because I feel like you can be happy as shit, but have terrible relationship with money. No, no, no. He, okay. Let me, let me say it a little, uh, let me say it differently. I think truly happy people know what really makes them happy is what I'm trying to say. So for them, Maybe what you're saying is part of it, and it probably is, right? That, oh, you know what? If I provide myself with security, delay gratification, that really brings me value. I think people who are just miserable don't really know what yeah. brings them joy and happiness. Well, and maybe the other- they blow the money on on quick fixes. What, what's the other 55%? You gave me 30% and 15%. Those are the two things that's the- Oh, that's all the other, they, they yeah. already talked to. Oh, okay, because yeah. what about the other category? I mean, that's that's only- you only talked about a fifteen percent chunk of the people and a thirty percent of the chunk yeah, of the people. What those are the, the two that stuck out in the art and the in the study that uh, they made the big the big point. I mean, I I always like, I know massive like, generalizations to me. I like, mean, it's like I don't I don't understand like really where um I I don't know I don't I don't see how like everybody's gonna fall in like well, let me ask you guys so this. I had a I had a theory before you shared all this uh, on why I thought it had accelerated from seventy to five hundred thousand right. in this short period of time because obviously inflation hasn't happened that much yeah. right but what has happened that is new since that original one is social media and I so know personally uh, the whole comparison well, thing. yes and when I was sixteen or even all the way to twenty something. Uh, when I if I were to picture someone who drives a Ferrari, a Lamborghini, any of those cars, I would never think of a kid. I would I, I thought of an old man who's retired. Like that's true. But now I absolutely I actually think I see more kids driving around these of social media. Yeah, because yeah. of social media. Now is it still is it is was it is it still the same? It doesn't matter. The per- perception is reality, right? So mm. I what we see now is that oh my god, look at all these people that have all these things. Yeah. And so now what used to maybe make you happy at 70 or a hundred thousand, because you're, you are, are looking at these uh, examples of other people, your peers that have all this other stuff. You go like, Oh wow. Well, I still don't have that. Well, there's uh, truth, you know? there's truth in what you're saying. Cause they've done studies on that where they find that um, people are happier when they feel like they're similar to the people around them, regardless of the income mm. that they're making. So like if you're quote unquote poor, but everybody else is poor, you feel a little better about being in your situation than if you made a little more, but everybody else made way more than you did. This yeah. is the whole like gap, income gap problem. Right, and right? let's be honest, these people, you know, you tend to do this, where, and we're probably all guilty of this, like you you don't follow the the broke kid who's posting pictures of his, his <laughs> dented up, you know, 1985 Toyota Camry, you know what I'm saying? You follow the kid who's got the, you know, cool ass Lambo, and you're but like, now, oh, now, wow, how'd he get that? That's well, cool. Now back to what I was saying. Imagine when you guys were 20 versus now, okay? Both times you win the lottery. How differently would you be spending the money and why? Right. Well, I think now you know what like the real value that could bring you. Whereas in your 20, you're like, oh, I know what I want. And then you'd figure out real quick, like this actually was yeah, a waste way of less my money. Impulsive. You know, I think about that a lot. Like, is it is it that or is it that on the journey to making, say, you know, five hundred thousand dollars? you had to learn new disciplines. Yeah, I'm talking about if you won the lottery, but that what you're saying is 100%. I think if you earn- well, there, And the reason why, because what, what, what I'm saying that it ties into what you're saying is that th- part of that maturity that I have now today is due to the work of totally. working up to that. Totally. If you took me at 20 years old and let's say, let's say today I made the same income as I made in 20 years and I never grew financially- I probably would probably spend the money the same way because yeah, yeah. I wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah. I ha- for for at least for me, I personally had to go out and do stupid things like pay for everybody's flights and Vegas trips and and buy things. You that had I, to I, learn I, that what was really valuable. And what that's was. right. And I yeah, a, it's it's and I could use this. I could use a different example. Imagine you know how they say youth is wasted on the young. You ever hear that? Yeah, yeah. It's like take somebody who's seventy and snap your fingers and make them twenty again. They will be. They will enjoy the More true present. value yeah. of being twenty than they would when they were twenty years old. So yeah, it's totally experience and all that. But my point with that is, you know what real value is, or what what money, what the kinds of value and meaning that money can bring you now, versus then. Like for example, yeah. How do you? How do you though? How do you? Um, I mean, how do you justify the seventy to five hundred though? 
I, that's my yeah. guess. Because your point makes, I don't disagree That's my guess. I think yeah, that happy people just- see how they quantify that. Yeah, like if I took, like, okay, I'll use an like, the example. I'm, I'm thinking of specific people. I don't want to say their names, but I'm thinking of specific people. Like I know people in my life that are just happy and there's people in my life that are just miserable. The happy person, if I gave them a hundred grand, I know where they would spend it. Mm. They would spend it on bettering themselves, education, classes, and travel. The person I know who's miserable, if I gave them that money, would spend it on- partying yeah, things, things, buying things, cars, clothes, you know, designer stuff. And studies will show quite clearly that, uh, experiences and personal growth. When you spend money on those things, you gain a ton of value. When you buy things, you don't get much value at all. Well, that supports the other thing that I've heard that I think is really, I think I've heard Ramsey talk about this, where it's like, uh, money doesn't change you. It just makes you more of what you already are. Mm. Kind of like when we talk about steroids, like, you know, like <laughs> totally. steroids, like everyone's like, oh, you got, you got an asshole ever since you did steroids. Like, no, no you were an asshole, asshole before. You're just yeah. a bigger asshole now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it just enhances whatever that is. The, the money is the same asshole. way too. It's like if you, if you have poor habits around money, if you were a prick before, if you were stingy before, if you, if you were frivolous before yeah. and you just have lots more of it, it's just, it, it's just an exaggeration of that. It just makes yeah. you more of the same thing. More yeah. fuel to feed off of. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Hilarious. I got to tell you guys about a study that, I love studies that are ridiculous where you read the study, you go, oh, really? You need to do a study on this? But anyway, they did a study on men and women's brains. Uh, on fMRI machines. So fMRI is called functional uh, resonance imaging. I don't know what the end stands. Magnetic resonance imaging. So they could see in real time how the brain, blood flow is affecting the brain, what is technically being activated and what isn't. And they took men and women and they showed them pictures of infants. Mm -hmm. And they said, let's see how men and women's brains react to looking at pictures of infants What's the difference? Yeah. What's the similarities? What's the difference? We just, like women get flooded with oxytocin and all the chemicals. Well, and with women, happy feelings. more the, the parts of the brain associated with empathy, mm -hmm. caring, understanding lit up more than the men's brains. Now, why this is a ridiculous study is because there's lots of wisdom. Like this is like one of those things that we don't like to say because it sounds, oh, the genders or whatever. Like we've known this for thousands of years. Every culture has talked about this that women are definitely primed to be more that way than men. I mean, this is why if a person abandons their well, the kid- the bonding is the most important thing in the very beginning. That's it. Look, if a person abandons a kid, a kid nine, nine out of 10 times, it's a, it's a dad. It's, it's a man. Women yeah. almost never do that. That's why if you hear about a mom who left their kids, everybody's like, oh my yeah. God, it's the craziest thing ever. And then you got the dad that you know shows up every other weekend and you get applause because <laughs> yeah, you're such a great- <laughs> yeah. I, watched that, I was watching Family Guy last night with, oh, uh, with uh, my kids and Jessica, and there was an episode where uh, Peter was taking care of Stewie because- uh, his wife, Lois, she was hurt and he's got Stewie at the park and then Stewie's like, oh, I went poop. So he goes to change the diaper and all the women of the park are like, oh my God, it's a dad changing a diaper and they all get around him and everybody's like, the music's playing and they all, <laughs> you know, all he's, clapping like this, for he's like a superhero just because he changed a diaper. Uh, yeah. I'm like, man, the standards are so I know, I always feel bad. <laughs> I feel bad right. for Katrina when that happens. It's happened to me before where I'm doing something like that, changing a diaper or I'm feeding Max. It's like literally, so it's like a five minute project. You know what I'm saying? They're like, he's such a good dad. <laughs> She's like, really? I do that all day. I every only day. do it in public. He does it for five to watch. This is for five minutes. Yeah. And he's such a great dad. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. But I mean, it's we're, we're wired fundamentally different. Now, so what lights up for the guy? So I imagine protection, protective. It just, type it's just similar. Just those parts of the brain. I could pull up the study. Those parts of the brain just don't light up as much. Mm. <laughs> so, Are we just a little, dumber? A little more yeah. dim. I just, yeah. yeah. I mean, look. I mean, look. Okay. <laughs> I have. <laughs> Look, I have. Uh, we're, just not we're, we're just not in touch with our feelings. Well, I mean, bro, yeah. I got. I have an infant at home, right? So she's, you know, she just turned four months, and she has tough nights where she gets up freaking seven times in a night, and Jessica's doing it, and she's losing her mind. And in the middle of it, Jessica's like, yeah, you know, oh, but she, I love her so much, and I can't. And I'm like, man, you know, every once in a while, I'll take over, and I'm trying to do this a little bit more just to give her a break when I can. And I'm like, oh, and she'll wake up three times with me for whatever reason, which is like, you know, I, all right, cool. Thank you. You know, I'm not getting the seven, eight time, but I, I do it. She wakes up three times. I'm like, oh my God, if I did this every night, I don't know if I would want to do this. I think I'd probably give up and be like, I don't want kids anymore. She does it every single night. And it's like, she's hardwired. There's something there that just makes her able to withstand that torture uh, to a point where it's just, for me on the outside of it, it's like, wow, that's pretty amazing. 
it's probably how she feels when I open jars that she can't open. You know what I mean? <laughs> It's like, wow, that's really, wow, how does he do that? Wow, (laughs) that's crazy what he could do. But anyway, you know, it's one of those studies where like, duh. Are you, uh, you're at a cool, you're definitely at a cool phase now with Aurelius. Like, are you seeing these? I I remember it, it seems like every month and still to this day, it feels like every month now, uh, the the cognitive leaps. Oh, huge. Like just the, like the things that they, like, like Max is now negotiating, which I think is, is just he like, really? oh yeah, it's so, it's like so. Now like, is he good? He's is really, he he's the really good, bro. Oh, yeah, he's so, really does that make you proud? It is, does make you proud. Yeah, so. like, he's <laughs> such a closer, dude. He's such a closer. Uh, and I call her out. I'm like, oh, you just got closed. Really? Dude. Yeah, <laughs> dude. Just, he gets it. I mean, I love it because. Has he done the alternate advance yeah. on her yet? Yeah. Or, or she'll like, yeah. so, you know, we, we have our, you know, structure, right. That we've been very consistent with on, on like what the routine looks like bedtime, but sometimes he wants to disrupt that oh i want to i want to play with daddy longer oh i want to do this and we should know we have bad time like that then he'll like negotiate well what if i don't read a book or i only read one book you know so he'll like negotiate like the other things that he does in his thing like or i'll skip that and so i could play with daddy longer or do this or i don't want to take a bath i'll skip a you bath know, tonight you so. know that is a huge leap though if you really think about it is it, no, a that, huge leap i was trying to explain that to katrina i'm like think of what's his brain like he's that, getting things that's that's, that's a that's a big cognitive leap to be able to it, it's one thing to like repeat what you say understand what yes. things are but then to also be able to recognize there's a pattern of what we do every single night, recognize there's time within that pattern that if I d- do this one thing longer, I need to eliminate something like the fact that he, like yeah. that's such a cool and knowing how to negotiate it yes. and make a deal that may sound attractive yes. to the other person. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. No, Aurelius does this thing where he'll start. Uh, so he likes me to tell stories. I think I told you guys this already and uh, I'll make up these stories and what he's super into cars, uh, not the cartoon. He likes that too, but he just likes cars. He likes fast cars. So you guys know I have a sports car. So we get in and I'll rev it and he has a great time with it. And he always likes me to tell stories, tell stories, Papa, tell stories about, and he knows the name of my car. He'll say the whole name out, which is pretty funny. So yesterday we're eating dinner and I'm like, Hey buddy, I want you to tell me a story. So he's like, okay. And he goes, Papa gets in the car. He pushes the button. It turns on. Then he pushes the pedal pedal and we go real fast and we're cracking up because he's telling the story. Yeah. So I'm like, tell me a story about mama. And he goes, angry. (laughs) 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 It was like fumes coming out of the drop. (laughs) Jessica was right there. You know what I mean? She heard that. I was like, oh my God, that's Uh, all I said was angry. (laughs) 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 That's hilarious. Uh, Oh, I love Max even like, dude, he's so like, he knows how to even um, like after he closes that deal and, and Katrina agrees, then he has like this move where he'll go like, mommy. And he waits, right? She, yeah, yeah, son, I love you. Oh, wow. And then she just, just seals like, oh, the deal. Oh, yeah, just whatever you want. <laughs> like, dude, I saw this kid knows what he's doing right That's now. Hilarious. Yeah, it's dude. funny. It's funny to watch out. Kids are great because they're so honest. Yeah. Like, they'll just say some crazy shit to somebody and just be like, like, I remember my oldest, he would just tell people, like, you have bad breath, you know, or whatever. I'm like, stop, <laughs> don't say that. To you know, you know, I, face smells, you know, like, you know how I oh. told you guys how we, like, we, I do like the stories and I'm like way more elaborate than Katrina yeah. is. Like he will, uh, is, wait, Katrina, Katrina's like, oh, oh you, course, told, she, you told yeah. me he, he encourages her. Yeah. Yeah. He encourages <laughs> stuff. Sucks. And so she's trying, like, she's always like trying new things that, and every once in a while when she's tired, she, she'll like, uh, she'll steal the story from like a song or something else like that. And he'll like, no, mommy, that's a song. <laughs> <laughs> no, mommy, you that's gotta a, make it up. Yeah, you, uh, you, you got to come with something original, or else he, he picks up on it and then he calls you. Out. No, <laughs> mommy, that's a song. It's it's not oh, a story. Man. Kids are great, dude. I got I got to tell you guys about um, switch gears back to to health a little bit. Um, I had this. I was thinking really deep. So we did that interview with uh, Dr. Will Cole. Great, by the way. That turned out to be a phenomenal. Yes, it did. Interview. Um, and you know, look, full disclosure, it was one of those interviews that. You know, I wasn't super excited about I wasn't not excited about I was like, oh, okay, functional medicine doctor. We've had a few on the show. He sounds cool. All right, let's see what happens. And it turned out to be one of my favorite uh, conversations. And it's getting shared like crazy. It was a lot of fun. If you haven't listened to it, uh, if you're listening, uh, you should go check it out. But anyway, there was a portion on there that really got me thinking. So he talks a lot about the, you know, the mind connection with the body and how stress affects the body and that kind of stuff. And then we were talking about autoimmune issues. And autoimmune issues... You know, a lot of people may not realize this, but this is one of the one of the big things that um, has exploded. Uh, one of the, be- the the chronic types of health issues that have exploded in modern societies, and we aren't quite sure what the hell's going on. Like an example would be like food allergies. 
Like when, when, when we were kids, which wasn't that long, I know we're older, but it wasn't that long ago. I don't remember a single kid with a single food allergy. It there was just one kid. You, so, okay, you remember one. One kid. one kid that we couldn't have peanuts around, and we always got so mad. And I feel bad now, but <laughs> just like to push him down at recess. Every <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we eat just a peanut butter sandwich out. and then breathe it on his face. Just threw peanuts out. <laughs> so fucked up. Put peanut butter on his backpack. <laughs> we were assholes. Yeah. I mean, Holy yeah. I'm, no, I'm I, sure. so I don't remember anybody. It was so rare, right? It was super yeah. rare. Um, now, you know, I have kids that go to school. Um, it, it's so prevalent that it's like, I'll estimate like 10%, right? Like one out of 10 or two out of 10 kids will have some type of severe food allergy. Um, and if you look at the data on autoimmune issues like Crohn's disease, um, colitis, um, you know, and other types of uh, autoimmune issues, they seem to be growing at pretty crazy rates. And so we can't figure out what's going on. Or whatever. Yeah. So anyway, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about autoimmune issues and, and what's actually happening. And what I'm about to say, I don't think is the cause, but I definitely think can contribute to maybe not an autoimmune issue, but rather can contribute to your own body kind of not really working with you. So the okay. flare up maybe. Just either the flare up or just, you know, you don't have an autoimmune issue, but I'm getting gut issues. I'm starting to get achiness and stiffness and hormone issues. And why do I feel like crap? So when you look at autoimmune issues, what it essentially is, it's your immune system attacking your body. It's recognizing a part of your body, whether it be your gut or your thyroid, like, like in Hashimoto's, and saying, that's a foreign invader, attack it. And it's so hard to treat because it's your own body attacking itself. And I thought, you know, um, this is very true. The body believes the mind, just like the mind starts to believe the body. So I'll give you an example. If you feel depressed in your mind, your body starts to, uh, it starts to mirror that. You start to move differently, you start to walk differently, you start to feel less energy. And vice versa, if you put yourself in a depressed position, you'll start to actually feel depressed. It's you, it's a two-way road. You can't disconnect the mind from the body. They're both the same. Okay. They're both connected, I should say. Which by the way, there's a bunch of studies to show like why like doing the Superman pose before you go into a meeting mm -hmm. or just by standing upright posture, how much that what percentage that can increase mood. So there's definitely a direct connection. There is, or by winning a chess match, testosterone spikes or something like that, right? So mind body, you can't separate them. They're, they're intricately connected. They communicate to each other. One believes the other and vice versa. It makes sense, evolutionarily speaking, that your body would believe your mind and, and vice versa. So if you have terrible body image issues, if you really hate yourself, you think you're gross, you think you're disgusting, I'm fat, I'm not worthy, lots of shame, you're telling your mind that this body, this person is not good. Could that eventually, or could that trigger Manifest. a immune response to where you're more likely to develop uh, gut issues, you're more likely to develop inflammation, you're more likely to develop uh, situations where you just feel like crap because your body and your immune system in particular believes the mind and says, this is a foreign invader. Now, also too, I mean, how much do you think a factor of having these diagnosis of um, you know, available in, in the lexicon in terms of like people's knowledge of like, you know, oh, maybe it's- I have this. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe you have celiac or maybe you have, and like they're throwing these um, symptoms your way and you're like, oh, I can identify with this symptom and I can, and now all of a sudden you're believing these and then all of a sudden it becomes a uh, part of, part of uh, what you think is well, happening. Isn't that what happened when WebMD got really popular? Uh, Didn't that happen to, uh, like well, as, as a population? Well, we these, uh, these contagions are actually, I think if I'm not mistaken, anorexia. Anorexia was, was quite rare until it became, I think some celebrities talked about it in the 70s, I want to say. And then it became like a phenomenon mm -hmm. among girls. It's like they call it like a social contagion. Maybe Doug can look up anorexia, social contagion, or it might be bulimia. Um, and you can see stuff like this where all of a sudden you have people uh, identifying with a particular mental disorder issue because other people have this issue or talk about. Yeah, I issue. wonder because I mean, I'm I'm sure there's uh, like physically there's there's th your body's reacting and like reacting to certain foods. I just I feel like maybe it accelerates because of the numbers it accelerated so much well, that now you have you know some kind of a rationale and reasoning uh, behind I'll it. I'll give you an example. You take a vegan who's a vegan because they vehemently believe in the in the welfare of animals. Like, don't kill animals, don't eat animals. Okay, and let's say you fed them you secretly trick them into eating red meat. Red meat, 
will not have a negative effect on your blood sugar levels or your insulin. Okay, it's 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 it's, it's fat protein. It's not going to have an effect on your body. But let's say you give that to a vegan, they eat it, and then you tell them, "Haha, we tricked you. You just ate some meat." Mm -hmm. You'll probably see a blood sugar response or insulin response because of the stress, the mental stress mm -hmm. of what they just did. Oh my God, I just ate animal. I don't want to eat animal. And you'll measure it physio physiologically that their body will react to it because of the, because of their mind, because yeah. of how they, how they feel. What does that say there? Yeah. So research in the 1980s and female college students first suggested that disordered eating behavior spread through social contagion, demonstrating that binge eating clustered within sororities. So it does sound like bulimia in particular is yeah. a social contagion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and by the way, these social contagions tend to proliferate more in young women than men because young women are more, um, they're more sensitive to, I mean, just to society in general. I mean, they're very yeah. good at reading. I wonder what was, the, more I wonder what was before bulimia. And I wonder if this, this is a common trend and it's just different things that, manifest. Yeah. There's theories around lots of different things with that. But I mean, my whole point with this is if you're hating yourself, if you're constantly hating yourself, hating your body and you're, you're, you can't figure out why the hell your body won't respond. Mm -hmm. Why do I feel like crap? What maybe try actively thinking differently. And it may not feel normal or natural to you because that's not your normal practice, but practice saying things and thinking things and finding ways to think of yourself better. And over time you you're probably going to notice some, and it, it's not woo woo. I mean, it's not woo woo. Again, the body believes the mind, so it makes sense that this would, you know, that this would well, have an impact. This, we had Doctor Roy von Togma. I forget his oh, last yeah. name, but like oh, about cancer. Yeah, and he, just the way that he would <clears throat> present diagnosis to patients and 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 try way more optimistic. Yeah, optimistic, and just like have have a more of a positive take. Uh, in terms of treatment, and we're going to really see like the success of this versus like the doom and gloom, like go all the way to, you know, like have them sort of prepare them for the worst case scenario and death, uh, you know, and saw a lot better result in the positive direction. Well, your, your wife was a nurse for a long time and she worked at pediatric, right? Yeah. Have you ever asked her about how children react to like surgery versus adults having the same surgery? Oh yeah. The kids are like, they don't know they're supposed to hurt. No, they, they don't get know. up and move around. Yeah. The adult's like, I need more pain. Yeah. Medicine. She's like trying to keep them on the bed and from, from jumping around and like, you know, ruining their stitches or whatever. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, kids don't have that, um, intuitively until it's, it's projected from their, from their, parents. I really feel like that. I mean, we talked, I just talked recently how Max went through this like crazy throwing up spell. And from the very beginning, we never freaked out about him puking. And I swear to God, that's why he's like yeah, right. nonchalant. He yeah. carries the bowl around, yeah. throws up, you know, apologizes, wipes his mouth, goes back to doing his thing. Like, doesn't even think it's a big deal because we never made a big deal about You're it. Right? So, yeah, a hundred percent. We did the wrong thing with Aurelius was know. sick, and a couple times we kind of freaked out because it was middle of the night or whatever. And I and a hundred percent, it scared him to yeah. now where he's a little worried, you know, yeah. about uh oh, you know, what's going to happen. So a hundred percent, they especially with children, they learn how they're supposed to react. And how they're supposed to feel and, and and regulate through their parents or through their caretakers. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we we messed up on that. Anyway, mm. uh, Adam, I want to talk about um, Park City, Utah. Yeah, our location there. Did, is it? What was the thing that we were waiting for? The sauna. And is it is it coming? Arriving in. I think the thread, Doug. Did it say two to three weeks? Is that what I saw? I believe that's what you told me. Yeah. Now, yeah. are there vacancies? Coming up, or is it totally booked? Uh, it's not totally booked. There is some vacant. In fact, I th actually think this coming month is actually one of the slowest months of the whole year. So if there's somebody that's interested in getting in soon. Um, but the last time we brought on the show, we had quite a few bookings right afterwards. So it seems like every time we've mentioned on the show, it tends to start to fill so up. So basically, quick. it's a how many bedroom? Again, this is a three-bedroom. Three-bedroom, mm -hmm. and it's in Park City, Utah. Yep. And uh, in there, you have sauna, cold dip, mm -hmm. PRX gym. Mm -hmm. Do you have steam room, steam room, jacuzzi, jacuzzi, and then you have the movie, red light therapy, red light therapy, movie theater, the last supplements, yeah, supplements and stuff inside there, yeah, all that, all that that is inside there, and mm -hmm. you can go to uh, mindpumpparkcity.com. You can also find us uh, on Instagram at the Mind Pump Rentals. Uh, on Instagram, you can see photos of inside it. A lot of it's not updated. We've done more stuff as far as like some pictures on the wall and some rugs and lamps. And so it looks a little bit nicer than what you see on there. It still looks nice, but it looks 
really plain. Cool. We've done more stuff. And the tile that I picked in the, in the kitchen worked, huh? <laughs> you guys made fun of me for a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah. Really off. tied it No, it was the blue days. cabinets that I thought wasn't going to... That's what it was. Yeah, you did the blue... I did the tile. You did the blue cabinets, and I thought, oh, I don't know about this, but... Once it was all done and the couch and the rug and everything, it really pulled everything together. So I feel like I had to contribute something. You know what I mean? No, it yeah. looks good. <laughs> I, I wish God. I wish we'd been out there more. I'm, yeah. It's like uh, well, I've we'll, been, we'll be planning a trip there real soon. No, know? we need to. The snow out there is insane. Well, we got to create. We have to create more workout programs, and so that'll be oh, a good place yeah. to do it. Agreed. Definitely. So, all right, do we have a shout out? Does anybody have a shout out for today? Will Cole, if you want to do him. Oh yeah, um, let's do his. Doug, he's great. Um, yeah, let me let me get the, his exact his Instagram. Yeah. yeah, I can pull it up here. He's um oh it's Doctor. Will Cole. So D-R Will Cole, C-O-L-E, um, functional medicine practitioner. He's most known for working with celebrities like Gwyneth Paltrow, but very smart guy and he communicates very well and effectively. So if you're into wellness and health, go check this guy out um, on Instagram, Dr. Will Cole. All right, check this out. Organifi is a company that pr produces and makes uh, plant-based supplements that improve performance, health, help with muscle building and fat loss, they have superfood blends that make it easy and enjoyable to add more variety and nutrition to your day as well. Great products, all plant-based, and of course, all organic. Go check them out. Go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the code Mind Pump. Get 20% off any of their products. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Kaylin from Canada. Kaylin, how can we help you? Hey guys, thank you guys so much for answering my question. I am like super nervous, so I'm probably going to just read my question. Um, but my question is about the rest periods, specifically the prescribed rest periods during anabolic. So I'm following anabolic right now. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about why I'm asking this question without making it sound like a bunch of excuses. Um, I'm a mom to three little kids. They're from two to eight. And I work out exclusively at home. Uh, that being said, most of the time when I'm working out, I have kids around who may be jumping in and out of workouts with me or who need parenting kind of in between uh, workouts. I have a two-year-old who has her own little set of two-pound dumbbells and likes to try to copy everything I'm doing, which Adorable. I appreciate, but it's also hard to lift heavy things with little kids kind of in and around my feet. Um, and then my older boys are five and eight, and I'm usually breaking up a wrestling match at some point during my workout. <laughs> Sounds about right. Um, yeah. Uh, I also work full-time, and I solo parent two to three weeks every month because my husband works out of town. So... I've done the wake up early in the mornings before the kids get up before. And I found I just got way too burnt out doing that. And I just never prioritized sleep as a former athlete who probably overtrained for many, many years after listening to you guys, I've kind of learned how to prioritize rest and the importance of rest and recovery. Um, so at this point, I'm hoping to not have to kind of get back to the 5 a.m. workout before work and before getting kids up and ready for school. So I guess my question is, how crucial is it to follow the rest periods? How might my progress be affected by taking extra rest? Um, and is there maybe a more appropriate rep range that would be more forgiving for kind of sporadic rest periods during a workout? Yeah, I knew where you were going with this question. And uh, I was smiling as you're going through it because it's it's cool to hear uh, and, and picture you with your kids while you're working out. Here's the deal. Uh, no. It's not that big of a deal whatsoever. And in fact, the splitting hair difference of being that uh, meticulous about your rest periods doesn't even come close to trumping what you're, the relationship you're building with exercise with your children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, well, that is, that is a million times more valuable what you are doing with your kids and allowing them to interact with you and see you doing that. Uh, it's not, it's not even in the same universe. Yeah, Kate, Kate, I'll, I'll say this too, Kate. First off, I don't know how you look so rested and healthy with three kids all under the age of, uh, what'd you say, eight? That's crazy. Um, yeah. Good good for you. So here's the deal. You'll get better results if you split up your workout throughout the day. By the way, ready for this? Most people would get better results that way. Not because, so it's not just because you're limited. In fact, taking a workout and doing it throughout the entire day would probably give most people better strength and muscle gains. Now, the set that where you would maybe see uh, a sacrifice is in endurance. Because you're not training with shorter rest periods, you may lose a little bit of muscle stamina, but who cares? Unless you're competing at something, if your goal is to be fit, healthy, sculpted, 
good metabolism. I mean, it, it, it's not that big of a difference. But when it comes to strength and muscle, you'll actually build more muscle and be stronger by allowing yourself to break up your workouts. So it's it's not a you're, it's not like you're sacrificing something. In fact, I've recommended this to people who don't have kids who are not in your circumstance, and I'll say, hey, do you have access to a gym all day? Try breaking your workout up into three or four blocks, work out throughout the whole day and see what happens. And they all come back and report uh, better results. So yeah, don't worry about the rest periods. If they interrupt you and you got to stop for 10 minutes and go back to it or stop and then eat lunch and whatever, put the kids down, go do the rest of the workout. It's you're, you're not just fine. You'll get better results that way. Yeah. I'm actually, uh, I mean, when I have clients that, that are concerned about rest periods, usually it's that they don't want to rest. Right. And they, they want to just keep powering out and get through the workouts when in fact, you know, it sort of defeats the purpose of when we're trying to focus on strength and building muscle. So, um, in terms of that and like breaking it up in chunks, it's really not going to have that big of an impact on you. But what Sal said in terms of having those short blocks, like it's actually going to benefit you more, uh, even, even to just go in that direction. So I think that you're in a great place. Yeah. I'll tell you what, if I had the ability to do that, I would actually work out that way. I would work out. I would take my hour workout and do like three 20 minute workouts and I get better. I've experimented with that myself. Katrina um, loves that now. We we did that while she was uh, pregnant, and when we first had Max, and she's just continued it on. She doesn't need to do that anymore. He's in school all day. She likes it, and she still prefers to yeah. kind of like she opens up our garage door, and she's yeah. like got the laptop out, and, the, and she's half working. She goes and does some sets, cleans some house stuff, comes back does some more sets. Courtney like, does the same, and it's like you'll take that one compound lift, you'll focus just on that, you know, leave, come back, do the next one. So it's like you can totally chunk. It out like that no problem yeah and it's i mean the reason why i don't uh do that anymore is it's inconvenient for me but for some someone like you it's more convenient so it's actually the better of both so and, and i want to communicate that because you're not compromising your progress if anything you're gonna see better progress that way so go ahead and let it be broken up do the whole workout throughout the whole day it's not gonna it, not only will it not make it a, a, a big difference it'll actually probably give you better results Awesome. Cause yeah, sometimes on like a Saturday morning, a, like a foundational workout could take me all morning. Like I get up and anytime yeah. I try to get up before the kids, it's like they have a spidey sense and they just wake up extra early that <laughs> yeah. day because they know I'm also awake. Um, and yeah, like for the mental health benefits, I try to do it when they're not around or sleeping, but then it's always that balance between yeah. rest and getting sleep and yeah, Here's having the them join me. Like I said, I kind of love hate at the same time. Here, here's one thing I'll say though, is if it starts to stretch out over like three, four hours, um, it's okay to have some food or some calories in between because what you don't want to do is go, you know, like skip meals because oh, I got to finish my workout because that'll start to become a problem. So I, you know, I've experimented th with this where I'll do like, uh, you know, five to six sets every other hour all day long. So I'll take a Saturday and just do every other hour. I'll do like five or six sets. But I'll make sure to eat a small meal in between most of those workouts because if I don't, then I'll start to notice detrimental effects. So that's the other part of it. By the way, we have somebody um, that has been in our programs who does this phenomenally. She posts on her page all the time videos of her working out with her kids in the background. I don't know what her page is called. Grace? Uh, yeah, Grace Barga. Yeah. Um, so you can look her up. I don't know what her Instagram is. It might be just her name, Grace Barga. But uh, she's been in some of our programs, Phenomenal Shape Fitness. I think she's got three kids too. And uh, she does the same thing. She just breaks it up throughout the day. She's a maps anywhere. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. You got I it. Uh, heard you guys in a, like a a friend introduced me to you guys on a, at a bachelorette party weekend actually, and we've been kind of geeking out over mind pump since then. <laughs> um, so I've gone back and listened to a lot of the older episodes, and there was an episode where you were talking about using a timing like a stopwatch to make sure you're getting kind of the appropriate rest, which kind of made me think of whether or not I was doing myself a disservice, but I appreciate kind of all the input. No, it's a, it's a good question. And it does make a difference. It's one of my favorite ways to, to get, get somebody who's in a plateau to kind of break that plateau, but that's not the novelty aspect but, of it. Yeah. But where, where you're at and in, in your priority, I mean, it just, you're fine. You're going to, you're going to be just fine. And it, we're talking about a splitting hair difference. Yeah, Think of it this way too. I'm sure that there's the occasional, Oh my God, I have an hour to myself, you know, type of stuff. In that case, go ahead and see if you can power through the workout and work a little bit on the strength and stamina. So I'm sure that that occasion will probably pop up a couple times or a few times a month, in which case then you'll get the benefit of the novelty, right? The fact that it's different. But it, otherwise, you're, you're totally fine. 
Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, no that problem. That makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> no problem. Thanks Dude. for calling in. All right. Yeah. See ya. Bye. 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 I love that. I yeah. love that question. I love that um, that we can communicate this because I think a lot of people skip workouts because yeah. they don't think they have, oh, I don't have 45 minutes, so why do it at all? Yeah. It's like you could literally do one exercise, do something else, one exercise, do something else, make it, you know, end up doing five or six or seven exercises throughout the day and get excellent results, yeah. amazing results. It was just this thought that it wasn't going to be effective, so so why bother and like, you know, having to get the, all the kids to go in the kids club and like have them accounted yeah. for and all that. No, bring them in, man. I love that. I, totally. Yeah, I mean, I, to me, that's, I mean, you all went the direction of, you know, her, that she's going to get just as good a result. I actually don't give a shit. Like, if she got worse results, I still think it's the move to do that. The, sure. What she is building with her kids, yeah. her kids interacting with her while she's working out, yeah. is the single most powerful thing that she can do to to allow that to bleed into their life organically. Oh, yeah. And, and, they just see it. They're and, around and, it. And, modeling and, it. Yes, yes awesome. modeling that. And, and so, you know, she could get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and her kids never see her work out, and she gets a more optimal workout potentially. Mm -hmm. But to me, hell, that doesn't – I'd rather yeah. I'd rather have a suboptimal work workout and allow my my kids to interact and see what I'm what I'm doing so that they then want to emulate yeah. it later on well, then try and schedule it where I'm away from them so much just because I selfishly want to make a little bit more gains. Yeah, well, here's the deal. The reason why I didn't say cuz that's true. What you said is 100% yeah. true. The reason why I don't say that is cuz she's a mom of three little kids. She works full time. Her husband's gone for two months, two weeks or whatever. Yeah. The last thing she wants to hear is about how she can be a better yeah, you know, she's trying mom. to yeah. find time to herself. Yeah, I get so, it, dude. So I'm like, I'm not going to say that. But yeah. Yeah. No, I don't. And, no, you, that's 100% true. So, 100%. It's not about being a better mom as much as you are. She, you're kicking ass. It's kicking more ass. about letting her know that yeah. like, dude, what you're doing Reassuring is, her. Yeah, yeah 100%. It's, it's, a, right it's amazing. Thing. Our next caller is Kevin from North Carolina. Kevin, welcome back. How can we help you? Hey guys. Yeah. Hey, I want to start out first of all, just by thanking you guys so much for all the content you put out. You guys were absolutely instrumental in me becoming a personal trainer and a nutrition coach. And I've just learned, I've learned a ton um, from you guys, listen to you guys consistently and still do to this day. So thanks for all the, the content you guys put out. Thanks, thanks man. Kevin. All right, guys, I got a question here. I hear you talking about the benefits of mini cuts during a bulk phase. And I had a couple of questions about programming these. Um, number one is how aggressive should these mini cuts be? I mean, are these just modest calorie reductions or are we not, are we not messing around? And number two, what's the best strategy for coming out of these cuts and returning to a bulk? Is it best to reverse slowly out of these or we just kind of pick back up where we were in the bulk? What does that look like? Are yeah. you using it just to interrupt a bulk? Is that what you're asking? Like, so like, let's say I'm on a, I have somebody who ultimately wants to put 20 pounds of muscle on and we, we've been on a bulk, let's say for, you know, six to 12 weeks. And it's like, you hear us talk about the mini cut in there. Is that what we're talking about? That's exactly it. Yeah. Kind of a break from that bulk or, you know, maybe somebody that's kind of noticing a little, getting a little fluffy and would like to just knock a little of that out before they get back onto the fluff yeah. or back onto the, the bulk. You know, how much the, the cut is as far as the reduction of calories really matters where they're, where they're at. Right. So like if I have somebody who's at like 4,000 calories maintenance, or that's what their bulk is, let's say their bulk is 4,000, their maintenance is 3,500. I could run them at a, say a 3,000 or 2,800 calorie cut for like, say a week or even like three to four days uh, really low and then right back to the bulk. So, and you can go right back. You don't need to like reverse out of that because we are, and you could, you could be extreme by the way. And I've done that with clients. If I have a client who has a very robust, healthy metabolism, they eat a lot of calories. I've done before where I like, we go four or five days, really low calorie, four or five days of really low calorie interrupting somebody who has a healthy metabolism, who eats 4,000 calories. It's not extreme. No. It's in fact probably really good for them to do something like that. Like, like mimic, have you ever seen uh, Walter Longo's research on the fasting mimicking diet where he, you eat 500 calories a day for like a week? Like no. I would, so, okay, so research some of his stuff. He's got some great, uh, great information around the fasting mimicking diet where you eat 500 calories. I have done that before where I've got somebody who eats 4,000 calories and then, but for one week, I, I cut back either all of their training or reduce it and go like, okay, we're just going to super low calorie and then I'm going to boom, right back the other direction again. So there's, there's not like this blueprint of exactly how many calories it looks like, but I would say it's a week or less. The shorter the time frame, the more, more extreme I'll go with calories. The longer the time frame, the, the less extreme I'll go. Here, here's how I like to base it, uh, Kevin, is uh, I go, I, I'll judge the cut on whether or not they're hungry. The goal is for them to be hungry. That's the goal. Yep. 
So if you know if, if I cut their calories and like, oh, I feel good. All right, we're even cut enough. I the idea with the mini cut is to more than all the other reasons because there's spur lo- the appetite. That's it. There's lots of reasons I could you know like, oh, okay, we're trying to minimize fat gain and improve the sensitivity to protein and blah blah blah. It's all minor. The psychological aspect is the most important. And so I just cut the calories till they're hungry because I want them hungry. I want them to come out of this three day, four day, five day cut wanting to get back on the bulk. That's that's 99% of the reason why I use it. Uh, I use mini cuts is to get them to feel good about going back on the bulk. Because once you've been bulking for a while, it's like you're force feeding yourself and you just get bored and I don't want to eat this much. So it's the, it, the number is based on how they feel. Are you hungry? No, I'm not. Cut more. Right. Oh my god, I'm starving. Cool, right. we're gonna stay here for a couple of days and go put put you back on the bulk. And there's no there's no need to re, to reverse out of it slowly. You just jump back in into the bulk. Got it. So when you say mini cut, you guys mean mini. You're talking. I mean, I hear you say three, four, maybe three, four days, maybe a week. It's but you're not doing like a two week or three week. Mini not cut, not for right? somebody you're who is around. You're in, you're out. No, yeah, not when it's an interrupter. Not, not when. Yeah, not. That's why I asked when we first started this question. Is like, are we talking about somebody who is like wanting to bulk, need to build, and we're just trying to interrupt it? If you're somebody who's like actually more in the like they're looking for longevity and health, they're not trying to gain twenty pounds of muscle. They just want to stay fit and lean. Like, and we've been on a bulk for say 12 weeks oh well then you could definitely do a little mini cut for three four weeks yeah because it, it's a different goal right but if someone is like and the cut's going to be less less aggressive that's right yeah so now we're not looking to make you we're not looking to make you super hungry we're just looking to make you feel good got it all right no that answers that answers my question wasn't sure especially how you're coming out of that so you guys would say just jump right back where you were so yeah. you're eating 3800 calories now you're eating 2800 calories do that for three four days Jump right back. That's into it. it. Yeah, reverse dieting really kicks in when you have a chronic low calorie. Eater. That's right. Someone who's been chronically eating low or binge restrict, binge restrict. That, that, that someone like that is somebody who you want to be really cautious with. Slowly increase calories. Someone who's got a robust, healthy metabolism that's you know eating th- three thousand, four thousand calories a day. Interrupting that with uh, a week of very very low calories, not damaging to the metabolism nope. whatsoever. The, the, the and that's kind of like that old adage of like, oh, it's starvation mode that's starving the body. No, you'll get health benefits from, you know, someone who eats 4,000 calories on a regular basis to all of a sudden going to 500 for seven days. That's not a big deal. Exactly. Cool. All right. No, that answers my question. All you right. got it, man. Thanks, Kevin. All right, guys. Thanks for taking my call. Keep up the great work. All right, no problem. All right. Actually, a great question. He always has great questions. Yeah, he does. I well, love- he's, you know, he, he coaches people. He works with people, you know, so he, he understands, like, he's going to get the questions that are the most um you know the, the most valid the ones that people are probably wondering he's one of my favorite guys in the nci group because he truly he, i feel like he really takes advantage of all the the opportunity with all of us that he gets mm-hmm. to see in the coaching thing yep. with the, what with the free stuff that we provide here like i love that i mean that was like the part of the idea of all this is like trying to promote these trainers to utilize all this stuff to better their businesses like yep. and so he's done an incredible job of watching yeah but again just to reiterate the idea is to feel hungry that's yeah. the main main yeah. purpose of that interrupting it's a good simple way to cut it. so like whatever you need to cut to feel hungry again that's where you need to go yeah our next caller is gilbert from california gilbert what's happening how can we help you hey how's it going guys happy good. to be here on the show it's kind you. of crazy it's surreal staring at you guys right now um uh, so I've been listening to the show probably for like a month now, but this is pretty much all I've been listening to. So appreciate all the advice and all the uh, being a dad, all the dad stuff you guys talk about. It's actually, I was like, oh, this is actually a pretty great show. It's not only about fitness, but now I'm learning stuff uh, that you guys deal with the same stuff I see. So thank you for that. You got it, man. Um, but to my question, um, so I actually just started um, or I just finished a cut. I'm about to finish a cut. Um, I was at 199 pounds um, January 9th, um, and I've dropped down. I'm uh, right at 170 right now, and I've dropped from about 20% body fat to 8% body fat. And this is like the most successful cut I've had. Um, I will say it was on 75 hard, and I know your guys' thoughts on 75 hard, but the, I'm just about to finish. Um, and so now I'm like, I want to make sure I, I know where to go next and I have a plan for it so that I don't end up, you know, going back to older habits. So, um, right now, um, I'm training for Spartan. So my plan is to do six, um, Spartan races, or obstacle course racing, um, this year, I have three that are like in the gym, kind of more focused on, um, 
gym exercises and then three outdoor ones, which I know is a lot, a lot of like pulling yourself up and cardio as well. Um, so really my question is, I know a lot of people say you can't do both where you're, where you're bulking weightlifting, which I love to weightlift and keeping your cardio up. And so like, I know there's a lot of people that say, oh, you can't do one. Uh, you can't focus on cardio and your, and your fitness there and keep your uh, weightlifting and bulking at the same time. So really my question is, I don't believe that. And I'm kind of looking for advice on what the best route to go is now, if I want to bulk up a little bit, um, but still maintain my cardio fitness. Yeah. I mean, you can do both. You're just not going to do both, uh, as good as you could Maximum. if they were your, yeah, if they were your only, only goal. Like if your only goal was to build muscle, then you would do it more effectively if you didn't simultaneously train for lots of stamina endurance for Spartan races and vice versa. If your only goal was to be, to improve your performance in your races, you would do better than if you tried to do that plus bulk. But mm. it doesn't sound like you're too extreme with either one and you kind of want to do a little of both, which is totally fine. So I'll mm -hmm. say this, um, if you're doing three to four days a week of Spartan type exercise training, one to two days a week of strength training is not just plenty, but that's going to be ideal. Three and three is a little too much. Uh, so I would go one to two, focus on getting stronger, then three to four, do your Spartan type training. And then here's the other important thing, very important. Make sure you eat adequate calories and protein. That's going to be the limiting factor for most people with that much activity. They tend to not eat enough to fuel any type of muscle gains. And then it's going to happen slowly, but you'll get a little bit of both. You do know we wrote a program for this, right? I do. <laughs> it was Just, all laid out, like, yeah, yeah, right up to uh, when you race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Well, we're yeah. going to give you MAPS OCR, bro. Yeah. I mean, that's why we, we wrote oh, this. Awesome. We, we wrote this specifically for someone like you that wants to build muscle, but then also do well at their Spartan race. So we program everything in there, every, including the, the cardio aspect of it, all the types of exercises that are going to favor you mm -hmm. in the sport. Like we know, like what, grip fo focused uh, strength training in there as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, we'll yeah, send that to you, you if you don't have it. Yeah. Awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah. And that, that's kind of where I'm going to, I'm kind of, I go to a gym that's like, um, my like group fitness classes, but now I'm starting to see that, like, it's not really tailored to what I'm trying to do. It's, you know, it's, I, more so for like beginner intermediate people trying to lose weight. Um, so that helps a lot. Cause that was my other question is like, where do I go now with my fitness or with my, uh, my workouts? Um, cause I haven't seen a lot of programs dedicated to like this OCR training. No, it's, this is an OCR specific program. Uh, we wrote it with a top racer. Um, and so it's, it's well programmed, but you know, I want to comment on the group fitness thing. They'll never be tailored for you. No mm -hmm. group class is ever tailored for an individual. So, mm -hmm. It's it's a way to work out, but it's the least effective way to work out. Okay, right on. You got it, man. But we'll send that to you. So follow follow the program as laid out, or if you want to kind of do it on your own, follow the advice that I gave earlier. Right on. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. All right, you got it, work. man. Thanks All for right. calling in. Thank you guys. Who was it that wanted to do a Spartan race? Was one of you guys was trying to convince us all to do it? Was it you, Justin? Uh, it I mean, I I was like considering it, but I wasn't. Like, He's the most likely to do I, it. Yeah. I probably will do it at some point. You know, did you see how my, my question? Somebody asked that just the questions I did yesterday. No, what happened? Yeah, yeah. I mean, people. I I think almost every time I do those questions, we get at least one or two people that would love to see us do it. You know what I told him? I said I would never say never, uh, but it's what I have learned in the nine years of us being around each other is that rarely ever has our goals all aligned. Yeah. I know. So that's the challenging I'm giving part. up on that. Yeah, you know, one, one guy's part. working on his gut health and stuff. The other guy's working on his mobility. The other guy's trying to hit PRs. Yeah. And, then, and then all of a sudden, this guy's working on his, you know, it's like yeah. getting all of our, our goals aligned to then want to train for something like that that's very specific. Although I'm a little salty because we've all done together these aesthetic goals and all that stuff. And you guys have never done a performance goal with me. Did we do all the together aesthetic goals at yeah, the same time? Yeah, bro. We were always, oh, let's cut. We did a body. We did a body. We did, a body, yeah. we did that Two body. Or three times. Body composition one. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. probably still yeah. never happened. <laughs> 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 Actually, that's not true. I don't want to say too much, but coming up. Oh, yeah. We are going to. Oh, you're train. right. Oh, you're right. We, we, do have, we do have a little bit of plans in the world. Yes, yeah, we do. Yes. That is true. That's that, exciting. That, and honestly, that'll be fun. most yeah. likely that'll be That's the, the thing one that, that I think all of us want to do. I think yeah. that this is going to be rad. Okay. Our next caller is Luke from Pennsylvania. Luke, what's up, man? How can we help you? Hi, how are you guys? Good. Good, Good man. Good. It's awesome. Thanks for having me on. <clears throat> Let's do it, Luke. What you got? Um, so I've run uh, 
ultras for about 13 years, um, up to like 200 miles, uh, and started resistance training about two and a half years ago. Uh, and I've grown to like it probably just as much as running. Um, I have two problems. <laughs> One is uh, I'm basically afraid of weight, increasing weight. Um, I just saw the podcast with uh, the Look Like You Lift guy, Braden Barrett, and he uh, made some real good points. And I hear you guys talk talk about um, like uh, the benefits of the big three and uh, lifting heavy weights and stuff. Uh, but basically, I'm just uh, worried about lifting heavy weight, right? Uh, and I was wondering if you guys had any tips on how to get more comfortable with heavier weight, I guess. Did you come from a place where you overweight at one point and then lost a bunch no. of weight? Like, uh, w what are you afraid of injury? Um, I think mostly. Yeah. Like if something's in like the 10 to 15 rep range, I'll do it and enjoy it and have fun. Um, once it starts to get heavy, um, you know, I get a lot more uncomfortable. So I tend to skip like the strength training portions of things. Like even with your programs, um, the strength phase at the beginning, like I would always change the rep range because the five rep thing is like difficult for me to, I, I don't know, like gauge, I guess almost to. And it's, so it's fear mm. of injuries. It sounds like the main thing. Well, look, there's two things. One is you're not maxing out. So if you're training for three reps, it's three reps with something you could do five or six reps with. Okay. Oh. So you're not PRing or not, you don't want right. to yeah, PRing. You have a high risk of injury. Training within that low rep range with the appropriate intensity, um, your 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 risk of injury is not much higher than it would be at ten to twelve reps. Until you get into the super high weights, uh, you're totally fine. So that's number one. Number two is you can go even lighter and just slow the rep down and perfect the form to make it feel heavier. So you're not to necessarily hit the load that's going to give you you know four reps uh, at that intensity. You could just make the rep harder so the weight feels heavier and it'll have similar results. And that's how I would start. I would start like that. I would take a weight that I could do eight reps with and can I slow it down enough and make it so that it feels heavy at five reps. And I would start there to get comfortable with the feeling of, of that kind of tension. I wonder if, if something like isometrics would help a lot in terms of like, you know, getting that kind of feeling and, and bracing effect. Cause I'm not sure if it's, there's an uncomfortable feeling there with like breathing and how to properly kind of like stay tight, stay right? tight and, and supported with your joints and like the whole overall system, be able to feel, um, you know, like you're, you're equipped, uh, in that exercise. So to, you know, to, to be able to, to use like a squat rack and like maybe, maybe, uh, focus on like a barbell squat where if you, if you can, you can put like these safety bars where you can push up against it, um, and, and get down in the hole and really like push as hard as you can and drive and just kind of get that sort of systemic effect throughout your body of just being tense and tight, uh, and trying to kind of work through that and breathe through that. I'm just think, trying to think a little outside the box in terms of getting you a little bit more comfortable, uh, within that environment. I think too, if you run a true four, two, two type of tempo with five reps, uh, the risk of, and, and not trying to, you know, PR on it, meaning that you still have like one or two in the tank, mm -hmm. the likelihood that you're going to injure that, uh, under that kind of controlled tempo yeah, is so normally what I do see is, and this is more typical with guys is guys tend to want to load, load, load because they want to, they want to get impressive weight and they care more about that. That all of a sudden I see the tempo speeding up, speeding up, speeding up. And the up. form goes to shit. Yeah. Just so they could put more weight on the bar and then the form goes to shit and then injury happens. But if you stay true to a good four second negative, two second pause at the bottom and then come up two seconds and you stay true to that tempo while doing like a, a five, five, five by five type of structure. Uh, I think you're going to be just fine and 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 load and keep trying to load the bar to where five reps is challenging yeah, yeah, underneath that tempo incremental and, yeah. and, yeah. and set yourself up with safeties. So if you if you have a rack, you can use safeties to catch the bar. And if your form breaks down even a little bit, you can always drop the weight. Mm -hmm. You can always yeah. dump the weight if you start to feel your form start to break down or, or move out of perfect. So you'll be you'll be totally fine doing that. And practice, I would practice dumping the weight on the safety so you know what it feels like. And then when you get into your set. 
if you feel yourself shift or your form go off a little bit, just put it down. And by the way, because this is something that you're aware of that you have avoided for so long, the gains will come on oh my God. like crazy if you yeah. do this because your body is- Any effort in this direction is going to pay dividends. Yeah, you're already the endurance guy. You're already the, the 200 miler. You already, so, so 15, 20, 30 rep and circuit type training and short rest periods is already what you're great at. And so- Something like five by five with long rest periods, slow tempo. Holy shit, your body's your body's going to respond like crazy. Yeah, I'll I'm going to send you Maps Powerlift because it's literally. Uh, I mean, it's all about doing this, mm -hmm. and it's all laid out, and the program is quite specific. So I'll send that to you so you have something if you want to follow something specific towards this towards this uh, direction. Oh, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, you got it, man. That's Any other questions? Cool. Um, just the other one is that like um. I sort of have like a, like a training, like ADHD, right? Like it's hard for me to stick to a program because I like to do a lot of different things that I enjoy training. Right. Um, so it's like, um, I, my goal is constantly shift, but there's like one goal that I always have is like, I have three sons, three, 15, 17, and I never want for them to ask me to do something with them. And I have to say no. So I like, I love using kettlebells. I like the hypertrophy, hypertrophy stuff. Uh, I do body weight stuff, but it's in the course of a week, I'll do all that stuff. And I know it's not like, like efficient or like the most effective thing I can do. So if I was okay with being like a jack of all trades and like a master of none of those things, what does that look like to you guys? Or, or is it just super inefficient and uh, no. I should Listen, program. the workout you do consistently is going to be the best workout. So is it like going to give you the best ultimate results? Uh, no, but because you do it consistently and you love it, yes, it will. So as long as you're not overtraining and you're training appropriately, I mean, what you're doing is totally fine. Now, if you have a specific goal, like I want to hit a new PR in this lift, or then you probably have to get a little bit more specific with your programming. I mean, we'll, like I said, I'm going to send you a program and maybe if because it's laid out for you, you might be, you know, more inclined to follow something consistently. But I mean, if you're like a fitness enthusiast, you do this for fun, you enjoy it, um, you you like doing different things, like then and, and you haven't hurt yourself, you're not training inappropriately, I'd say keep doing it. I would just be uh I would just caution you to be mindful of the your intensity and approach to all those things, right? So if you have this ADHD, you love endurance, you know, you you probably could handle a lot of volume and intensity. And so you maybe you trained really great that week following MAPS uh, power lift, and then you're also wanting to do all this kettlebell stuff and stuff with your kids yeah. and all that. Like, I would never tell you don't do that stuff with your kids. I'd say that trumps everything. So do that stuff with your kids. But then reduce the intensity dramatically. Yeah. Like, it should be more like play with your kids with those types of exercises and things like that. Like, make sure you don't approach it with the same mindset you do when you go for a 200-mile run. And if you can reduce it oh, down and simplify it. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So if you can, well, I was just thinking about that. Cause yeah, I mean, obviously I like that you care to, you know, entertain your, your, your children and do those activities with them. I think that's very important. Um, and so to, to reduce it down and simplify it, like it just focus on one of those core lifts uh, and treat it as a skill, but yeah, obviously modify your intensity, but at least that way too, you're kind of building and developing that comfort, uh, in that direction. So that way, you know, say one, at some point you do feel inclined to kind of run through an entire program. Like you've been building slowly and developing that skill right. on that direction. Yeah. Uh, the intensity is my problem. It's always low. It's, it's rarely like Super high. So I'm, I'm, I train frequently, but it's like, um, uh, it's so usually, yeah, not I, mean, at all. You're, I think you're okay though. If you train as often as you are, you're probably doing the right intensity. I mean, you look pretty fit. Do you feel healthy? Do you feel fit? Do you feel like you could perform? Yeah. Like sure. So yeah. way better. And if I'm, yeah, way better since I've started uh, resistance training than, than just doing the endurance stuff. Listen, I feel over. Listen, if you train a lot, very often, you need to, you're supposed to train at low to moderate intensity That's most right. of the time. Yeah. So you're probably doing better than you think. Mm -hmm. okay. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for calling in, Luke. All right. Thanks, you guys. Thank you very much. You got it, man. You guys are awesome. This guy had forearms in him, huh? Did you see those? I, yeah, he was OCR guy for sure. Yeah, no, he looked yeah. great. You know, what we should have asked and we didn't ask him, I'm curious to what his squat and deadlift is because maybe 
relative to everything that he does and his body stuff, he's maybe he's actually pretty damn strong. Right. You know, because sometimes you get caught up. You see like everything on Instagram. You're like, oh, well, this because he does 400, 500. Thing, yeah. yeah, maybe the dude's like he's deadlifting 315 or something like that. Maybe he's squatting 225. Or it's whatever. just it's, like, a, it's, a, pr- it's just, a practice thing too. Like like I 100% will walk up to a squat bar and fear a set of 20 reps. I will fear it. I will not fear a max set, a max rep. A max rep for me is like, let's do this, right? And it's because I do one more than the other. It's a practice thing. Once you yeah. practice it, then you get more comfortable with the feeling of like, because, you know, if you get good at sets of 12, 15, 20, it's different than a set of one, two, and three. It's a different, you summon strength differently. You summon the force yeah. differently. It's a different mindset. Um, and y- if you get used to one, the other one is like, it's just out of your league. It's not something you're used to. It gets really challenging. So you just got to practice it. Once you practice it, it feels, um, it's no, no longer scary. I don't think I've ever seen a client or even just like a normal gym goer get hurt in a true four two two tempo. No. Mm-hmm. It's always somebody who is loading the bar. Because it's so controlled. And, they, and, yeah. they, and they're just wanting to put more weight on there and they're, they're in and out of the hole as fast as they can or they're ripping it off the floor yep. as quick as they can. Yep. Somebody who is in a controlled four two two, I have never seen blow something or yeah, hurt something. Even if you use a weight yeah. that you can't handle because it's slow and controlled enough for you to identify. That's right. I can't yeah. handle this. You, you put the shift, weight down. You're going to be on top of it. That's yeah. right. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to Mind Pump Free. Dot com. Check out all the free stuff that we give our listeners. It's amazing. You can also find all of us on Instagram. Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. I'm on Instagram at Mind Pump DeStefano. And Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 